The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm David Minton, and this is uh, Stephen Pashby, and we're from uh, Design Hammer. Um, we're a uh, full-service website design and development firm over in Durham, and we're happy to um, be selected to give our talk today here on um, doing SEO for Drupal. And I'll let everybody know this is the first time we're doing this particular talk, that we regularly give talks about SEO in general, and so it'd be great to get some uh, feedback at the end. So um, we've got, I think, about 75 slides, but we should be able to move through them pretty quickly. Um, we'll see how we're doing on time and um, if we've got a chance to take some questions um, during the talk. So if we've got some, uh, we'll try to answer them. And if not, then we'll have some time later. So just to give you kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about, we'll do a little bit about our um, philosophy on uh, SEO and some fundamentals, and then we're going to go into three major areas. We'll talk about uh, off-page SEO, um, on-site SEO, and on-page SEO, and why it's kind of relevant to see these three things differently. So here's a little bit about um, the fundamentals and our philosophy about addressing SEO. So I'll hand this off to Stephen to talk about the fundamentals. So why worry about SEO? You know, you've seen uh, you've seen the movie. If they build it, or if you build it, they will come. Wrong. Um, you know, if you go to the next slide. Basically, folks will find you if you appear in the search rankings, not just because you've built a site. So, search engine optimization is quite important if you want people to actually check out what's on your site. Um, uh, we tend to focus on Google as it has the lion's share of at least the U.S. market and generally English-speaking market, uh, but you know that's one thing to think about depending on who your uh, who your audience is, what search engines they use, as to how you optimize for. But this talk is primarily geared at Google. Um, yeah, just a quote from uh, uh, SEO Ma's uh, co-founder. Uh, you know, it's you know just pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of difference there. Um, so one of the things that we find that's kind of uh, interesting with uh, with SEO is there are widely accepted kind of best practices, but no one really knows how Google works except for Google. So you know, the the Google wants to protect kind of their their algorithm, what they're doing. So uh, basically, a lot of SEO is kind of reverse engineering and trying to see what works and then Google says, hey, you know what? These folks are uh, appearing higher than we want, so we're going to alter our algorithm. You all can figure it out. Um, so, you know, Google kind of works in mysterious ways. So there are a couple different types of SEO. Uh, one you may be familiar with is pay-per-click. Um, there's also organic search. And with organic search, there are a lot of different things that you can kind of control. Uh, both off-page optimization, on-site optimization, and on-page optimization. So paid per click, you know, essentially advertising, uh, Google AdWords, Yahoo, Search Marketing, Microsoft Ad Center. Um, not really based on your website content, so not really relevant to exactly how you set your website up. So we're not really going to cover that a whole lot, but it is a way to drive traffic to your site, so you should at least keep it in mind. Um, off-page examples. Incoming links from other websites, it's pretty big, um, including links that you can kind of control, such as uh, links that you tweet or post to other social media. Uh, On-site examples, if you've got uh, search keywords you want to find, be found for in your domain name, in your file path, uh, having an XML sitemap, uh, also your server availability and load times, all kind of factor into your search engine placement. And then on-page examples, actually having the search terms that you want to be found for in your page title, in page headlines, in image and link attributes, in addition to in the text of your content. Uh, so this is a search engine result page, or SERP. 
Uh, so we'll just kind of go through some of the different parts of that. So these are ads. So you, you all know this. I mean, you've gone to Google, right? So folks tend to know where that is. So the, where folks tend to go for trusted information is the organic listings, which are down below. So we've got uh, a search for web design in Durham, and we showed up. Um, kind of the anatomy of that. Uh, so we've got the page title. It's fairly important. And then the URL and the description. Now, a couple of things you kind of notice about this right off the bat. We saw our, our search was for Durham Web Design, and Google helps us out. It says, hey, website design is in the title. So let's put that in bold. And design is in the URL. So let's bold that there. And Durham Web Design is in the description. So let's go ahead and put that in bold, too. So if you've got the keywords that you're looking for, regardless of where you rank in certain places, you can kind of influence some user behavior to get them to your site. So pretty helpful. Uh, so we like to think with, um, go to the next slide, Dave. That's the next slide. OK. All right, so I'll take over and we'll start talking about our philosophy. But one thing I'll point out here is you'll notice in just your typical Google, Google SERP result, there's very little that someone's going to go by. And everybody seems to be really fixated on getting number one results. But if you think about it, there's really a lot more to that. And someone's making their decision based on this information right here. So it's more than just number one rankings. So in some ways, we think about usability as well. It's not just numbers. Um, what are the keyword phrases? What are the results? And how do they change over time? But how is someone going to interact? And so I think um, if there's anything you get out of this talk, it's probably going to be um, this slide right here where we talk about user behavior. And it's going to be something that's really obvious to everybody once they see it, but I'm kind of surprised when I talk to people. Maybe this is a sharper crowd than most since um, you're all Drupal developers and users. But everybody seems to be focused on a top search position, phase one. And then we go to phase three, and we've got profit. And we all know that's just direct. There is no phase two, is there? Well, is that true? Not really. Um, you get a top search position. But the question is, um, that's a search you thought of, but is that a search that your users thought of and your potential customers? If they're not doing that search, then that number one search position did nothing for you. And if you're not optimizing your site for the searches they're actually doing, all of your time is wasted. So if it's not optimized for the user's searches, you've failed. OK, so you have figured out what search phrases your users are doing their searches for, and you've got respectable rankings. Then the next question is we think back at the SERP, and we've all done this. You do a search. You look at the number one uh, result. You look at the title. You look at the description. You look at the URL. And it doesn't seem to be what you're looking for, and you pass over it. And you go to one of the lower ranking, or you even go to subsequent pages, or you give up and do another search. So obviously, that's even you know, really important as well, that all of your on-page optimization, or off-page, or on-site, to get top rankings, and you haven't written a good description and a good title, and someone doesn't click through to your site, it's also wasted effort. All right, so you've managed to do both now. People are clicking through. But where are they going? There's a good chance they're going to your home page. And if it's not obvious what they're looking for is on your home page, there's a good chance they're going to give up and bounce. Every one of us has done searches. Every one of us has done that. So more successful searches, you've probably wound up on a page, some people call them landing pages, that are optimized for that term. You realize, I have found exactly what I'm looking for. If not, you might bounce, go back, do another search result. And if you do, then you've got a greater chance of uh, performing some kind of a transaction that we can equate to as profit. And this is something that a lot of people in SEO lose sight of. All they focus on is getting that top SERP result. And it's really a much more complicated process. And so that's an essential part of our philosophy and why we're talking about all sorts of different aspects of SEO. So I'll, um, I'll continue on and talk a little bit about um, different off-page optimization. 
So one of the key things in off page is links. So links are really powerful. You remember link. Well, not, not that link. We're, we're talking about um, incoming links. And here's um, a great example I use for SEO. It's used for all sorts of different things. Um, I do a search for click here, and if you notice, it's a little hard to read, but um, there are actually over uh, 3 billion results returned if you do a search on click here. So that's to give you, you know, something in comparison. You do a search on the Beatles, you only get about um, 68 million. You can throw in all sorts of pro sports, and you still only get about half the results of how many pages there are that have the, the, um, the phrase click here on them. So it's a really competitive term. Now, if you look and see, what's the top result for click here? It's Adobe Acrobat Reader. This is actually from a couple years ago. This is one of the few slides that survived from a, a previous talk. And um, you notice there's even someone who is smart. There's a marketing agency that's probably done this example as well. And they named their agency click here because they know people like me do this uh, example for presentation. So the question is, out of um, over 3 billion pages that have click here, why did um, this page show up? And what kind of backlinks? Yep. So who said click here? You win a book. Congratulations. <laughs> So there are probably tens of thousands, if not more, pages out there on the internet that have click here as the anchor text to that page. So even though everything that we sort of know, if you know something about SEO, is all about getting keyword phrases in the right part of your page and on your site to optimize for that term, and here out of three billion results, a page that doesn't have that phrase anywhere on it shows up number one. And it's all because of what we call uh, off-page optimization. But on the other side of that, since this is just an example, and does anybody actually do searches for click here other than people trying to do this presentation? Here's uh, a graph um, from Google Trends. And you can see, you know, in comparison, what, what people really look for. Um, the Beatles are like a little line at the bottom. And some other terms are actually much farther towards the top. So. Um, that kind of gets us into you know, what we talked about, which was keyword research, that you really need to know what phrases um, your users are searching for and trying to make sure that you can get them, among other things, into backlinks. Because you know, isn't it great that they're number one out of three billion, but it's a phrase nobody uses, so even though they didn't work for it, if they had worked harder to get people to actually use other words as part of the anchor text, they would have had all that incoming link power to get a more useful phrase to be um, at the top of a SERP that was actually useful to them. So now we'll move into uh, uh, on-site optimization. So here we're going to start getting into um, some more Drupal stuff. Is everybody familiar with robots.txt files? So uh, if you're not, it's uh, a file at the, uh, the root of your web server. And it tells uh, crawlers, um, generally search engines, which pages they should or should not address. As far as SEO goes, this is probably the absolute most important thing to get right. There is nothing else more important than that. I'll show you why. Um, this is actually what the robots.txt um, module looks like in Drupal 7. I think Drupal 6 looks pretty similar. Just lets you edit. Um, Steve and I doing some research for a client came across the site. Don't be these guys. Looks like you know they put a little effort into this website. Probably want people to find them on search. So um, if I do a search for their domain, they get a number one listing. Has anyone here ever seen a listing like that in Google? There's no description. There's no title. Do you know why? They could have put incredible amount of time on all sorts of optimization, 
but they told Google, we don't want you to see our site. <laughs> yep, yep, they told everybody. So as I said, you know, they probably had this on their dev server to keep their dev server from getting indexed and then forgot to change it. So as I said, if you get nothing out of this talk but that, never make that mistake. Don't be these guys. I mean, honestly, actually something that we do is we don't put it on our dev server to make sure we don't make that mistake, and we just put HD access over our dev server. So um, XML sitemaps, um, it's something to help search engines um, find particular pages. They probably know about your site, but um, if you're updating site very regularly, it helps them um, find new pages and new revisions of pages. And um, so it's got URLs, uh, last update, um, how frequently pages update, and you can give them a hint of how important you think the pages are relative to other pages in the site. And um, this is what uh, a rendered sitemap looks like in uh, Drupal 7. And so you can see the different columns. Uh, one of the things that's nice in, uh, in the module is you can set it to uh, automatically publish these and to notify um, being in Google um, that you've got XML sitemaps. And since, as we noted, they do, um, they handle about 80% of search traffic in the US. So even if you just do those two, you're gonna do pretty well. And then um, we can talk about uh, URLs, path, path, auto. Uh, you wanna hand this off to Steven so he can do some more talking. <laughs> Yeah, don't want you to get tired, David. Uh, so you've got a couple different uh, options uh, with Drupal regarding your path. Uh, one of the strengths of, um, of Drupal is it actually allows you to use clean paths, which are pretty helpful. Uh, so um, it's pretty important to get this right. Go to the next slide. Um, so uh, here is just a core path with clean URLs disabled. It's pretty messy. Um, a, lot, a lot of the, the path stuff can be very useful, uh, particularly if you've got folks uh, who are passionate about your content and social media and they're going to be sharing uh, URLs. So you want this to actually one copy and paste clean, so they actually get there. And if you can get a little extra benefit out of it, which we're going to see, then that's nice. So with uh, clean URLs enabled, take out the little query there. But if you put something like the path module in there, uh, automated by path auto, you're able to actually create some human readable URLs. And a lot of times, this is going to be pulled from, for example, your, uh, your content title. Uh, though there are some other options for that. And so with that, with that content title, that's likely going to be some keywords that you would like that page to be found by, just because you, know, you probably titled it something about the content on the page. And so if someone posts that on Facebook, hey, they just put some of your keywords in a link going to your site. Isn't that awesome? Uh, so we can uh, check out the uh, clean URLs module. Um, pretty straightforward. Enable clean URLs. It's a good thing to do. Um, and then path and path auto. Um, there are, uh, you can set up the different aliases that you'd like to do this. Uh, you can also do some stuff uh, with different tokens if you want to kind of mess with a bit more. You want to jump back to canonical and redirect? You want me to take that? All right. Um, so we talked about making some clean URLs and, and preferably even uh, human readable uh, paths with path and path auto. And now um, we can talk about redirects and canonical. So with redirects, you can redirect from one path to another. So it's possible for some reason that you're going to want to have um, multiple um, different paths to get to the same page. And you can do that with aliases. Another thing that's really important is if you're doing a redesign either from a different platform or even from one version of Drupal to another and you decide to rearrange contents in your site, you really want to do redirects, and, um, which are effectively uh, 301 to redir redirects. 
uh, for a couple of reasons. One, just usability. There are probably a lot of incoming links to your site, and um, anyone who's going to um, get a 404 page is more likely going to bounce off your site rather than uh, finding the content they want. And also, as we talked about, there's a lot of power in incoming links. And so if there are a lot of incoming links, you're going to lose your credit you're going to get from the search engines if they're going to get a 404 pages rather than to real content. So for both the usability and the SEO uh, purposes, you want to be really good about um, making sure all of your links are current. So here's um, the path redirect module. And uh, one of the neat things about it to uh, help with our 301s is you've got an option of a listing of all the 404 errors that you're getting. Um, a lot of them are going to be probably um, bogus or attacks, like this domain uh, in question has never been a WordPress site, and so people trying to get to uh, WordPress login.php are probably just trying to do some kind of script-based attack. But on the other hand, if you find um, um, some listings that are real pages, even if there aren't that many of them, it's always good to fix them because um, you'll help your SEO results and the usability. And it's always easier to fix it on your site than try to track down um, which site has an old URL in it and then somehow getting them to fix it. And then there's uh, Canonical, which is kind of interesting. This is something that uh, Google's been pushing rather than doing um, 301s for um, duplicate content. And so this isn't like aliases that you have one page and for some reason you want to have um, multiple paths that go to it, but for some reason you actually have multiple nodes that have very similar or identical content. Um, there are some different reasons that you want to do that, but um, one of the things that Google doesn't like to see is duplicate content. Um, you can get penalized, uh, especially more if you've got content from other sites um, and they think that you're ripping off content. If you've got multiple sites that you own and therefore you're not stealing content from somebody else, it's important to do this. But the other thing is we talked about the power of incoming links. If you have, say, five very similar pages that are all effectively the same information and if somebody landed on any one of them, it would be just as good as the others, what you can do is use the uh, canonical tag and to say, um, this one page is essentially the master, and any incoming links that go to any of those other pages, treat them as if they went to the canonical one. And therefore, if you had, say, 100 links, and 80 of them go to one, and 15 go to one, and five go to one, if you use the canonical to the one that gets 80, Google will treat it as if it was getting 100, so it's gonna help it. And so we talked about preventing dilution of the incoming links and also reduces the chance of a penalty. Um, originally, Google required that Canonical would um, be limited to pages on that site, but recently they've allowed you to do it across domains. And that's something that can be done um, through the meta tag module. You actually have to kind of scroll down. It's in the advanced section. But um, for any particular node, you would add what the master one is. And I don't believe you actually have to put it into the master because it's, it is the master. But I don't think it hurts if you do. All right, now we'll uh, shift back to uh, on-page optimization, which is the part of SEO that people are probably most familiar with. So one of the things with uh, on-page optimization is you're actually going to be trying to optimize your content for search results. So we're going to talk about um, a couple of modules and also probably some best practices for how to actually fill out the content of your Drupal site um, just to kind of make sure that we're doing the right things. Uh, so uh, probably two of the most important things if we kind of think back to the, uh, the SERP page we looked at earlier are the page title and then the meta description. So the page title is your most important tag for SEO. Well, the robots.txt, you got to get that right to get indexed at all. This is probably the single most important tag that you can have on your page. Um, it is the top item in your SERP listing. Uh, now, Google will choose what part of that it shows. 
Uh, so if you've got a long one, it will truncate it down. Uh, if it's too long, and it will actually pick if um, if you've got kind of uh, one that's pretty long, but it feels like past where it normally would. That's the relevant stuff. It'll pull that uh, over to your uh, over to your SERP listing. Um, but it's you know very important. Now your default in Drupal is a node title bar site, right? Um, which can be fine, but a lot of times you'll want to optimize that maybe a little differently to kind of take advantage of the ability of Google to pull out some different keyword phrases um, that you're not going to want to have in your node title because your node title is on your page and that's something that your, uh, your users are going to be reading and so it, it can look a little funky if you're like SEO, da 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 and you know, it doesn't look very good. Uh, so actually being able to separate that out allows for you to uh, either individually craft ones for each page um, or to do kind of a token-based approach. And there are modules to allow for this sort of optimization. So we're going to just go through uh, two of them really quickly. So we could either individually create for each page or procedurally create via tokens. Um, in Drupal 6, page title module, um, you can see you can do kind of a token-based approach or uh, you can actually uh, go to the, uh, when you're creating the, uh, the node, just type it in. Uh, the same sort of thing, meta tags in Drupal 7 really has kind of taken a lot of these uh, pieces and put them under one roof and does a really, really good job with it. And so here's an example of using it in Drupal 7. Um, that's kind of the basic one, but again, you could either clear that out, do something custom for that page, particularly if it's a landing page that you're really targeting from a lot of different efforts, or just set it up you know, to do whatever your site philosophy is. Um, the meta description. So the uh, meta description is kind of an interesting one. This is an opportunity for you to entice site visitors. So if we think back to our SERP page again. We had the title, we had the URL, and then we had a description. Now, the meta description is not used um, to determine your placement, but Google and Bing and Yahoo may choose to use the meta description or part of the meta description as that description of the uh, page listing. So that can be very handy um, if the search engine determines it's relevant. So it allows you to kind of craft that a little bit more because uh, we all know that when we go to search results, if you see something that looks like kind of gobbledygook, you're less likely to click on that one as opposed to if you see one that looks like, hey, that sounds like what I'm talking about and it looks like it's kind of put together professionally. So again, you're influencing user behavior through the meta description. So again, it's not counted for placement and it allows content creators to uh, craft a targeted description of the page. And it, uh, with the proper modules, it can be individually created for each page or procedurally created via tokens. Um, for Drupal 6, you want to look at node words. Uh, and for Drupal 7, once again, meta tags. Uh, and again, you can just edit that right as you're editing your content. And you can either create a, a crafted one or do a, uh, a procedurally created one. Um, crafting for meta description is probably the way to go. Uh, you may, with page title, want to go with a kind of a procedural approach. But really, I, I think for most of the time, if it's a page you really care about people finding, actually creating a, a crafted meta description is pretty important. Now, so that's kind of some module-based approaches. Um, another really important thing is structure versus presentation in your content. Um, so I, I assume that we've got most folks in here are kind of some basic understanding of HTML. So, you know, you've got your style and your structure. So title tag already got that in control. Uh, H1 generally is uh, your node title. So um, that's already kind of in there. 
and then we've got paragraph title, for example. Um, presentation would be, you know, style, CSS. So we're going to look at a couple examples of good structure. You've kind of got nice layout. You've got your top headline. You've got your subheadlines, and then kind of how that lays out with structure. And then this looks pretty much the same, right? I mean, it's the same sort of thing. I can see where the headline is. I can see where the subheadlines are. Except this is all accomplished with, uh, with style. There's no structure here. So the problem with this is that um, search engines make the assumption that if something is a headline, the words in that are more important than the stuff that's in the content. And so if you want to take advantage of that, you need to make sure that you, A, enable your content creators to actually use that, and B, educate your content creators to actually use that. So a lot of times, um, you know, we'll, we'll get hired by a, a client to do some SEO for them, and we'll go and look at whatever CMS they happen to be using and realize that, for example, headlines are filtered out of their, uh, their content editing. So they're unable to actually do this. So you actually have to make sure that you empower your content creators to actually use proper structure as appropriate and that you educate them to use proper structure. Um, so that's kind of, you know, th does that make sense, uh, the underlying difference between structure and style and how that can be pretty important for SEO? Um, so another important thing about uh, SEO is it never really ends. Um, it's not, well, I've optimized my website for SEO. I'm done. I'm going to go do something else. Because there are other websites that are like to do, you know, have a top placement. So it's a contest. You know, it's kind of an ongoing race. There can only ever be one number one placement for one term. Um, and in order to move up in the results, you have to get over other websites. Um, and then another pretty important hurdle is if you don't do proper keyword research, it can be really a lot of wasted effort. Anyone ever gotten the, uh, the emails? We can make you number one guaranteed in five terms. So, I mean, yeah, you can. And a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have clients and they're like, well, here are the terms we want to be optimized for. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like anything your desired audience is ever actually searching for. But that's, 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 that's what we call it. Well, that's nice. But if you want people who are searching for something to find you, you actually need to have that on your site, maybe. Good idea. Uh, so, you know, actually all this stuff without keyword research is really a shot in the dark. And if you've got a site, a lot of Drupal sites, a lot of content creation going on, you need to actually have your content creators on board to make this successful. So it's not just about setting up the modules correctly. You actually need to make sure that folks are on board and, you know, willing to, to do, fill in the right fields. We had, we had a, another client who we did some SEO training. Like, oh, that, that's great. That's too much work. We're not going to do that. All right. Well, you know, that, that's, that's your choice. But you're not going to get the benefit of having a system that allows you to do this if you don't actually fill it out. So, you want to conclude, David? Yeah, I'll uh, give my take on some of the hurdles as well. Um, one of the big things that a lot of people forget is that SEO really is a race. One of the other things we do consulting on um, is accessibility. And accessibility is great because everyone can be a winner. The ultimate goal is all websites are accessible to everyone. And it, I don't know if we'll ever make it, but it's a great goal and it can happen. SEO, everyone can't be number one for the term that they want. That's just it. It can't happen. And as soon as you manage to do it, the only way that you got to be number one is the former number one is not there anymore. And there's a good chance that they probably put a lot of time and money into getting to be number one, and they probably want to get back there. And so no matter what you do today, someone else is going to try to up you tomorrow. 
and there's a good chance you'll get knocked off. So it's, it's a constant struggle. And the other thing, going back to uh, Stephen's quote about Google, is Google works in mysterious ways. And they're constantly changing their algorithm. And so what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. Um, we've had a bunch of clients recently who said, we used to be on the first page, and now we're on the 10th page. And I didn't change anything. What happened? Well, because Google made some major changes, and they penalized people with incoming links to from um, what they call low-quality sites. And so especially people who hired kind of less scrupulous SEO consultants who got them a boost by getting their site linked from what we call link farms or other low-quality sites. And it worked for a while. And, and a lot of kind of disreputable SEO, the reason people do it is because it works. You're not supposed to do it. And if you get caught, you get punished. But it works. And that's why the search engines don't want you to do it. And so you, you've got to constantly keep up with all these different changes. And um, no matter what you do today, you, you have to keep up and you have to keep working on it. Because someone will bound to do a better job than you are tomorrow. Um, And the other thing to just really stress, as Steven said, is, is if you are not the content creators for your site, you have to get them to buy in. That once you've done the research, you know what the phrases are, you've done your best practices for Drupal, so the site is set up so that they can optimize their content, they actually have to do it. They have to be aware of what the terms are, and then they've got to work that, those terms into the content, and they also have to do it correctly. That, um, it's best to use headlines. They've got to write good titles to entice people. They've got to write good meta descriptions to entice people. And if they're not going to do that work, then all of your best practices that you're doing as the site builders is just going to go to waste. So um, just kind of going to conclusion, which is essentially, um, we really like working in Drupal. Um, it's got a really good foundation for doing good SEO. Sometimes there's kind of some hiccups. Um, when there's a new version released, we were really comfortable working in 6, and then 7 came out. And we all know some of those key modules just weren't ready. And we had to kind of struggle. Luckily, somebody stepped up and you know, made the modules that we needed to be able to do the optimization, optimization in 7. And now there's a really good suite of modules for 7. And we're hoping that um, the transition to 8, when it comes, is going to be even smoother than the uh, transition from 6 to 7 was. So um, we'll kind of run through a few more slides, and then we'll go into some questions. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Drupal Camp Charlotte for um, allowing us to speak. And also want to put in a plug for the Drupal Association. Um, which I hope everyone is familiar with. Uh, Design Hammer is a member organization. Um, Drupal organization is the group that needs to raise money to allow free software to work. Um, Drupal.org costs money to run. Uh, Drupal camps are a lot of work, and, uh, or rather the Drupal cons. So uh, I think individual memberships are pretty inexpensive. They're like 30 bucks a year, and the organization one's pretty cheap too. They, we were asked to talk about a survey that was online. I'm not sure if this is different than the paper one. It's different? OK. So if anyone wants to jot this down, um, there's an online survey that the organizers of the camp would like you to do. Everybody got it? Nope. It's a bit.ly, capital K, lowercase j, capital V, I'm sorry, capital P, lowercase v, capital, uh, lowercase h, capital U. All righty. And so here's all our contact information. Um, Steve and I are going to write a, a blog post, and we'll put our slides up um, on that so everyone will have access to them. Here's also all of our um, social media properties. Um, it'd be great if um, everyone would like to um, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We do all sorts of fun stuff there that we don't write too much. Um, we give away prizes periodically. Um, we haven't announced one, but I think we'll probably be giving one away 
in the next week or so. So sign up now and know about it. We usually wind up giving away Apple TVs or cool stuff like that. And we'll announce those on uh, Twitter and Facebook. All right, so does anybody have any questions? OK, I'll pass the mic. Are there any automated tool sets for, that are integrated within Drupal to be able to do that kind of monitoring of once you've got the SEO and one front end of setting up to create the content and also optimize it? Is there a module or something that can kind of go in and using the cron tab or something just kind of go and check your ranking periodically? I'm actually not sure of anything on Drupal itself. And because we do work on a lot of different platforms, we tend to use third-party tools to do that so that we've got one place to go for all of our clients. Um, we had a quote from uh, SEO Moz, which is um, a really good resource. In addition to just um, different articles and white papers that they write, they've got a whole suite of tools. Um, some of them are free and some of them are paid. Um, I know we've got a paid membership, so we've got access to a lot of them. But I think most of the, even the uh, them are available as free. They're just um, limited in what they can do. And uh, let's even talk a little bit about those because he's got more experience with them. So um, a lot of the different uh, options. I mean, uh, you can use uh, let's see, with SEO Moz. One of the nice things with SEO Moz is they actually have their own independent. Um, link network so they've actually done their own independent crawls and they're essentially trying to um, be able to provide a lot of the the authority that Google uses to determine kind of the the, the weight that different links bring to a, to a page uh, they're actually trying to kind of duplicate that work so that's one of the reasons we like to to do them is they actually have some very powerful tools to actually analyze all of the incoming links to your site, what pages they're going to, what the anchor text is on those links, um, and th also their estimate of how um, how much authority is coming from that particular link. So that that's some very powerful tools, and I mean, it's a pretty reasonable thing for a uh, professional membership for that. Um, so that that's actually pretty helpful. Um, they also will do, uh, you can do stuff like uh, have ongoing monitoring where you can track over a variety of keywords across a variety of search engines. They also let you uh, determine um, what region uh, you're, you are or appear to be for the search engine. Uh, so uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of folks will, um, particularly unscrupulous SEO folks will say, well, you know, you're appearing very high in, you know, your search engine on your home PC. Very good. And, uh, you know, click on your link twice a day and you'll rise up there because, you know, they're logged into Google. Google is trying to present what it perceives as the best results for that person. So regionally close websites are, it assumes, more relevant and websites that you click on are more relevant to you. So um, actually using a third party service uh, like SEO Moz is really helpful because you can say, I don't want a regional uh, skewing and they're pulling in so it's kind of immune from a lot of that piece. Uh, so that can be really helpful. They also can do uh, on page audits to let you know um, both potential keywords in a page uh, and also kind of the tagging of the page, how it's kind of set up and things like that. So there, there are a lot of different options uh, with some third party tools like that that we, we like. Any other questions? Thank you. So we're at the university, UNC Charlotte, and uh, we have a lot of subdomains. And so Google recently changed the way, you know, they, they, they didn't want you to, it's considered part of the main domain. So I, I really wonder what your experience was with subdomains and how interlinking within each other, if there's any benefit to it. Um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, conversation about this topic, and so we're, we're wondering if it's if, of any effort for us to try to incorporate that cross-linking in there or really focus on the external, so. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of the different search engines treat it differently. I know early on what they would tend to do is um, um, 
give less credit for incoming links coming from the same class C because they assume that it's something like this or kind of less scrupulous that people would run their own link farms. And if they did, they would tend to be within, uh, you know, very isolated um, part of the IP space. And so you didn't give as much credit for that. And I know that's um, actually one of the things that some of the more comprehensive backlink tools will tell you is um, not only just how many different top level domains, but how many different class Cs. So I think that um, as, as developers get more savvy that they're kind of um, being um, cha changed in the way they're treating that. And I'm not sure how much benefit you're getting right now, you know, for having it all in one versus having separate ones because there's some plus in that the larger the site, um, it's one of the beliefs, the larger the site, the more authoritative that most of the search engines will see it. But then again, any of your main sites are probably going to be fairly large to begin with, and your subsites are probably going to be fairly large as well. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but I'd say if you can do a lot with um, incoming links from other domains and other classes, that's probably going to do better for you, um, even though it's more work than just just focusing on cross-linking between your subdomains. But if for nothing else, we go back to the usability part, and if you think it's useful to your users, then you should do it. Well, we use custom search, search engines as well. Uh-huh. People are already on our site using our search. Okay. It helps in that regard, but we're also wanting that external. So I guess we have to right. change what we're trying to yep. achieve. Okay. Uh, any other questions? It's the last one, I think, in that the meta tag section. No. Yeah, in the description, do you you always recommend we put node summary? That was just it. That is default. So uh, the, the default with meta tags is node summary. And I mean, that's a good generic one uh, because if you're filling out the node summary, it's probably going to be um, an appropriate sort of meta description. Uh, you know, it's going to be a summary of your article. Um, the, the one thing to keep in mind is you see the uh, preferably 150 characters or less. Um, again, if you have it longer than that, Google's going to pick out the relevant parts. So you can, it can look chopped. Whereas if it's under 150 characters, if Google decides that's the relevant description for that piece, then it'll look a lot more uniform. So again, uh, if you've got content creators with the time to do it, actually filling in a, 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 a carefully crafted uh, meta description is usually the better practice. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things is it's, it's a balance. It definitely doesn't have to be the summary. You're always going to do better if you have handcrafted paths, handcrafted titles, handcrafted summaries rather than token-based. But on the other hand, token-based is better than nothing at all. So, you know, that's why it's default at least. Even if you're, you can't get your content creators to do this custom, at least there'll be something. And it's better than nothing. But if you go down to the advanced, uh, the I guess past the advanced options, there is a lot of different token options that you're able to to use through the meta tags module. I mean, probably 50 or 60. It's it's a lot. Okay, I think uh, we're about out of time here. Okay. Yeah, are there any other questions? For someone working on sites, um, 
especially in a small company, do you recommend either of the, I know there are at least two uh, SEO tools and SEO checklist? For that, I think a lot of it depends on uh, your workflow. Um, if you're creating a lot of content and you know, kind of getting pulled around to a lot of different things, um, the checklist can be handy because it's basically, have you done this, have you done that? Um, we don't tend to use them uh, because at least uh, on the, you know, at least for our site, uh, because our workflow tends to be, uh, we like to review internally um, content before it's published. And so once content is ready for review, one or the other of us will actually take the time to, to review and do some keyword research and actually craft the meta description, stuff like that. So a lot of it depends on the workflow. Um, we've got uh, some clients that are fairly large and so they actually have a review process built in. So if, if that is an appropriate workflow for the site, then those can be handy. Um, but if not, you know, if you don't use it, then it's just a module cluttering up your system. Do you have any experience with Acquia's uh, Dev Cloud has these like built-in tools, and one of them is like an SEO grader? Any experience with that? So we've just started moving over to Acquia, um, and we don't yet have a site that we've had a chance to play with that on. Um, I'm looking forward to trying it out, but uh, I, I know it's out there, and it sounds very interesting. I just haven't had a chance to play with it yet. We just started moving like two or three months ago. So um, I manage a website that has a funky acronym, and it's pronounced Haystack, but it's spelled totally differently, H-A-S-T-A-C. And I have a colleague who's like, why don't we get, this, get all over the search term Haystack, like the word Haystack. And my, my thinking was, that is already a word in English, and people look for the, that word mostly aren't looking for us, although a lot of people don't know how to spell our name. Does it make sense to try and use that as a meta tag or put that somewhere? So that's a, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, a lot of times you, uh, you used to find people would include potential misspellings and stuff in, um, in their meta description or uh, in you know, different parts of their site. Um, Google's actually pretty good these days at saying, I, I think you meant this. So what I'd do is I'd actually, uh, I would actually see uh, what happens if you took haystack spelled like the English word, and maybe one or two other keywords that might be appropriate to your organization, and see if Google's able to figure that out. Um, because if Google's able to figure it out, then I think that it'd probably be okay. Uh, so I, I would check that first. Um, because ideally, you want to be found by things that are appropriate, and it's possible it might be interpreted that you're trying to be found by a term that is not relevant to your site. Um, and, and so there could be a penalty involved with that. So I would, I would see if Google's able to figure it out on its own. The other option would be to, to actually have on your site and your site contact content. Well, you know, you know, yeah, th this, this is pronounced haystack. And, uh, you know, lots of times people make this mistake. Um, one thing, just a quick aside for keyword research, if you've got uh, something that people are finding your site for, um, it might be something you could write some content about that to improve, if, particularly if folks are finding your site and finding some value in it. Uh, if you've got uh, analytics, uh, Google Analytics, or if you're looking through your, your log analysis software and, and seeing, wow, this is kind of odd. People are finding me for this. I'm unintentionally optimized for that. It's an appropriate something for people to find me by. I might as well write some more content about that. So, any other questions? Uh, not, not a question, but um, one of the things we see a lot of people use analytics for is they, they look at what the top keywords were and they copy and paste them and put them in the keywords, which is kind of it seems self defeating that Google already knows about that, and then they exceed you know the 20, 30 keywords in there, and none of them are really relevant to the page that they're on. They need to improve their keyword and not focus on the page. So they, that's, it's kind of an interesting problem on a couple different levels. One, uh, your analytics, you really have a chicken or egg problem, right? Because this is what people are finding your site for, not necessarily what 
the people that are searching for your site are using. So that's, that's your first problem. Second problem, actually putting it in your meta keywords tag is essentially useless uh, because all you're doing is saying to anyone who's maybe auditing your site as a competitive analysis, here are some terms I'd really like to be found for. Um, because um, Google does not use those at all. Um, I think Bing and Yahoo use them very, very slightly. Uh, but Google categorically does not use the meta keywords at all. So there's no use in doing that from, from you know, the majority of your search traffic. So yeah, it's kind of two areas there. To educate them, but they're convinced that they're getting good results. But well, people are finding your site, but those aren't the people of the quality that you want. Yep. So yeah, we, we like to try and uh, set up um, goal tracking and analytics to say, okay, what, what is... What, it, what do you want people to do on your site? Okay, so we've got isolated that behavior. Now let's see what keywords are actually converting people. And then you can say, okay, well maybe those are the ones that are important, not this one that we're getting lots of traffic for and they immediately leave. That's perhaps not very helpful. Yeah, just an uh, addition on meta keywords. I think it was probably maybe in the mid 90s that search engines stopped using meta keywords and we all know why because it's just so easy to try to game the system because users don't see them and you could just stuff anything you wanted to into them. Um, to the point that when Google came around, they realized they weren't useful and uh, according to Matt Cutts, one of their um, lead spokespeople, uh, Google has never used meta keywords for, for placement. Though, the one thing they are useful for, and you could do it in other ways, is if you're running your own site search, you're allowed to game it however you want to. And if there is a phrase that you want a page to be found by, even though that text isn't there, you could make the medic. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.
cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>